Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. You know what Christy Matthewson wor- wasn't worried about? S-I-E-R-A. When you're thinking about Pedro Siriaco, I mean, the only one that can compete is maybe uh, Hannes Wagner's 1908 season. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Kern. Like, if we just clip together every time we've talked about him on other people's profiles, we've done a Mickey Cochran episode. I can't get past Rabbit Marinville. It's you know, it's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio. We're talking baseball kind of whenever. I am your host, Christiana. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. Hey, doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing pretty well today. Uh, we've had, we had some trades go down. Like the trade deadline is only, what, three days away now? Four days away? Yeah, I guess um, I guess five if you count the second because that is going to be a day. But yeah, trade deadline season is here. We got a lot to talk about, and uh, I guess I say we just get into it. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, the one of the big one of the first big uh, pins to drop dropped on um a couple a couple of days ago. Yeah, I think it was on a uh, Wednesday. Uh, it was uh yeah Andrew Benintendi gets traded from the Royals to the Yankees. Um, and the Yankees didn't give up too much, which I don't know. It makes sense. You know, Ben and I didn't think they were going to get that much for him. Yeah. Ben and Tendi, Ben and Tendi's, uh, been good, but not, um, great. I, I would say, but he's been a good player consistently over the past couple of years. Um, so, what did you what are what are you thinking about the uh, Andrew Benintendi trade? I mean, it's interesting to see how, like, you know, as a player, like just based on what he's been doing on the field, I would say Andrew Benintendi has more value now than he did when he got traded from the Red Sox. He's coming off of a really tough year in 2020 where he didn't play well and he was injured. And he was also coming off a down year in 2019. You know, it had been just about two years since he had really shown why he was the number one ranked prospect in baseball going into the 2016 season. And because of his control at the time, I'd say the Red Sox got more for him than the Yankees gave up uh, the second time he was traded, but uh, he's having a career year. Um, he has a, he has a career low strikeout rate at 13.5. I know Yankee fans are going to love that. Um, yeah. He's a walk rate of 9%. That's the highest it's been since 2018. Also, also excellent. Um, his expected statistics are kind of right around where his, uh, where his actual statistics are. I mean, his, you know, people are going to look at the average versus expected batting average and see a 316 versus a 277 and be like, oh no, that's not good. But his ex- expected batting average is in the 89th percentile. Like it's very hard to have an expected batting average above 300. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, that swing, you know, is going to play very well to Yankee Stadium. You know, if you're a Red Sox fan or a Yankee fan, you saw it for years. Uh, I think I think every one of his home runs at Yankee Stadium in his career has gone to right field. And he's a guy that can play that short porch very well. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, Andrew Benintendi, I think, was his first home run at Yankee Stadium? No, it was uh, in Detroit. It was in Detroit. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's had. I now I'm now I'm curious at the career splits because I feel like he's maybe it's. I'll, I'll look into that right now. Yeah, um, maybe it's internal uh internal bias, but uh, and like just thinking. Yeah, I get I it though. Know. It did. It did feel like it did feel like he did well against the Yankees when he was with the Red Sox. He had a 795 OPS at, or he has a 795 OPS at Yankee Stadium, um, okay. but seven home runs in 29 games, which is like that. That's more of a like over 162 games. It's like over 30 home runs. So I think he hit home runs at a higher rate at Yankee Stadium. Um, yeah, I love but, how it's known as Yankee Stadium Three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, we're we're almost at a point where, like, very few active players played at the old Yankee Stadium. Yeah, that's true. Like, I think Brett Gardner was the only surviving Yankee who had done so, and he's no longer on the team. 
right right um but yeah uh benintendi he kind of um like he's going to be playing left field that means joey gallo is going to be getting much less playing time i would imagine um yes i, I would guess they plan to have like uh you know benintendi out there probably every day uh judge of course is going to be out there every day um and i also think they're going to get uh aaron hicks out there um and matt carpenter uh because i don't know or matt, matt Car- carpenter has to be out there yeah with stanton on the uh with stanton on the il they'll probably have carpenter DHing. um but in, when Stanton comes uh, off the IL, they'll probably have Carpenter out there again um, mm-hmm. because Carpenter has been one of the great surprises of, uh, of 2022. Yeah, um, he has the slugging percentage over 800. He does. He has been struggling to, out of the break, but uh, yeah, what a pickup that has been for that team. Yeah, it's been it's been crazy uh, to say the to say the least, but yeah. I think. I think this trade comes down to like they they sort of made this trade last year getting a left fielder um you know obviously very different types of offensive players but similar offensive production like heading Mm -hmm. into the trade if you if that makes any sense but but like joey gallo was supposed to be a guy that could have you know an ops around maybe 800 that's kind of what he was consistently at before um, he just hasn't been that guy currently as it stands today, he's hitting 159 with a 621 OPS. You know, I was looking at his baseball spot earlier. He's, you know, his strikeout rate is even higher than it was in seasons past. And it was already sky high, uh, as well, along with that, you know, he's, he was hitting the ball softer, um, just a, a, a really bad season for him. Uh, can't deny that. So I wish, I wish he could have worked out. Yeah, he was. I think I think anyone, I you know, there's a bit of a Yankee bias where it's like, well, who's a Yankee? I don't want him to work out, but I really do wish Joey Gallo worked out. Um, Lindsay Adler of the Athletic. I don't know if you saw this, but this morning she had a a column about uh, where she like talked to Joey Gallo, and he he was very candid, and it was kind of it was kind of hard to read, but he was like, I wanted to play here. I wanted to play well here just as much as everyone else wanted me see, to see me do so, and like. Anytime we're going to look at a Yankee hat or a Yankee uniform for the rest of my life, I'm going to be reminded of my time here, which is, it's sad. Like I, it really is hard to read because I think we could almost chalk Joey Gallo as one of those guys that just couldn't get it done in a big market. You know, he, he thrived in Texas. I think he can thrive elsewhere, no doubt. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it really sucks knowing that it just couldn't work out in New York. Yeah, exactly. Um, like Gallo, I remember, you know, he for a couple months he was one of the hottest hitters in baseball. Then he got traded to New York, and we expected that to play really well. I think that was a pretty big deal when he when he got uh traded over there. Um, he kind of had average offensive numbers um from the trade deadline on last year, and then this year it's been um it's been pretty bad. Uh offensively for the Joey idea Gallo. of us the idea of a stand and judge gallo outfield was so fun yeah and like yeah. it just never happened one because stan like couldn't play the outfield last year and then joey gallo just couldn't earn himself any more playing time this year but i mean it's it, yeah he's probably gonna get dfa'd if he can't if he doesn't get traded um Right. But I really do think, and I think most Yankee fans even think this, that he's going to do well wherever he goes after after New York. Yeah, I mean, uh, like Joey Gallo has got plenty of time to, um, plenty of time to develop into the player that he has the potential to be. He's in his age twenty eight season. He's going to be a free agent this year. I imagine he'll probably take a one year deal somewhere. Um, maybe do extremely well there and then get another contract after that. I feel like that's the path for him. Um, no, I could see him. Uh, where? I could see him with the Braves. Yes. 
Yeah. I think he would play like that ballpark very well. I think the Braves would would take him on. Uh, I think he fits well into what they're putting together over there, uh, especially with the DH in the National League now. Uh, like imagine, you know, Matt Olson and Joey Gallo in the same lineup is fun. They used to be division rivals, very similar type of offensive players, uh, you know, left-handed yeah. power hitters. I think I think that's a fit. I think there are plenty of fits, but that's the first one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, yeah. Like um, you know, I also one of the one of the teams that I was looking at is like a team that could target Benintendi because they had poor left field production was the Braves. So mm-hmm. um I think I think that would be a, a fit for them. And the Braves have, you know, they have done that like a thing where they sign a guy for a year and then they kind of uh, get back on their feet, most notably mm-hmm. with Josh Donaldson um, back, yes. in, 2019. back in 2019. But yeah, I mean, I, there are plenty of fits like I could see I could see Cleveland as a fit. Um, I think Minnesota would be fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. That's, for you sure. know, that's already a home run hitting lineup. You add Joey Gallo to that. Uh, I think you got something special going there. Um, there are so many. I could even see like Tampa taking a taking a flyer on him. Yeah, Tampa, like, yeah, if he's if or he's Seattle. If he's like under 15 million a year, I think the Rays could definitely go for him. You know, it would be fun too. I don't think they would do this, but Colorado. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. that would. If he finds it again, he could hit 50. Yeah, potentially. It would be very funny seeing him go from like a an 80-weighted runs created plus season to a 50-home run season in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, – I don't think the Rock. I don't think the Rockies would do it, but it would be so fun. That would be a lot of fun. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I'm kind of just thinking out loud, but there are really so many fits for Gallo, and I think it would be very fun to see him in many different places. And New York, unfortunately, just couldn't be one of them. Yeah, New York could not really be one of them. Um, and uh, it's it's time for Andrew Benintendi to shine. Uh, Benintendi, by the way, he's hitting 316 with a 776 OPS. Um, he hasn't uh, been slugging the ball really at all. He's slugging 393, but he's getting on base at a 383 rate. So, you know, that's, that's mm-hmm. the fun balance of OPS is like you can... That not... is. It's funny because... If you look at like the like Joey Gallo at his peak would probably be around like a low 800s OPS guy because yeah. he's never been a batting average guy, but that OBP and slugging could lift him high enough to where his OPS makes up for his low batting average. Andrew Benatendi gives roughly the same offensive production, but in a way that I think Yankee fans would be more happy with. He's making more contact. He's uh, he's still getting on base at a high rate. You know, I know that it's not, and you know what, like New York has so many power hitters that they can balance out with a guy like Ben Benintendi that isn't going to slug 400. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, um, they put Ben Benintendi top of the lineup last night and, um, and yeah, I think, I think it just, it fits the roster more. Like they already have, they already have home, they, they're home run hitters. They already have their guys that are also going to take walks and Ben Benintendi also is going to take walks he's almost at a 10 percent walk rate this year um but you know him being able to get on base uh at a 383 clip um i think that's going to play pretty well for the for the top of that lineup um i don't think it's going to mm-hmm. be a crazy awesome move for the yankees but i think it's going to be a pretty it's going to end up a pretty good move for the yankees it's going to be, I think I could see him. I mean, he's already had a lot of moments in the postseason uh, with the Red Sox, ironically enough. You know, 2017, he had a big game-tying home run off Verlander. 2016, he had a home run, like one of the few good Red Sox postseason moments that year. Yeah. 2018, you know, RBI in the World Series in the first inning. He made that game-saving catch in Houston. He's a guy that can have some moments. He's already got a few under his belt, and he's going to have a chance to get more. Yeah, yeah, potentially, for sure, for sure um yeah and it makes me wonder like if this goes well um like the potential of the yankees signing him to a a longer term deal um as he is a free agent uh upcoming i think i think if the yankees win the world series this year that will like exponentially increase their chances of doing so because like when a team wins a world series 
they always try to bring back all the pieces they traded for because they only know him. They only know them as, you know, you won us a World Series. Like, you look at the Braves last year with guys like uh, Adam Duvall, you know, uh, Eddie Rosario. Yeah. Red Sox did so with like Steve Pierce when he won World Series MVP. Yeah. I, I could see that they, happening for sure. They signed Eovaldi back after his amazing postseason performance. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I mean, the Nationals signed Steven Strasburg to $245 million. Um, yeah, but that he also doesn't really fit the description of we only remember you from winning the World Series. But true. yes, they did do that fresh off a World Series win where he was World Series MVP. I guess they did that with more with like, um, I think Daniel Hudson. Howie Kendrick. Oh, Howie Kendrick. Daniel Hudson. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Howie that's, Kendrick, Daniel Hudson. Yeah. That's a better one. Those guys. Um, Just about every team does it, except for like maybe the Dodgers who were like, all right see you jock peterson yeah (laughs) yeah exactly um so so yeah yankees got benintendi um should be uh should be an interesting addition and um yeah should play yeah i'm wondering yeah i'm wondering because lemahy wasn't in the lineup last night uh so i'm wondering who will be in the leadoff spot whether it will be benintendi or um lemayhu i don't know how much i I wasn't paying attention to the royals i I wasn't sure how much benintendi was leading off like um he wasn't they they were putting melendez in the leadoff spot a lot yeah and like i just remember um benintendi not having a great experience in the leadoff spot with boston mm mm-hmm so maybe honestly, I mean, like number two hitter. Now that I think about it, like you could probably chalk the three ninety three slugging up to Kansas City. I wonder what his home road splits are because that's a really hard ballpark to hit in. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I'm actually on a splits page yeah. right now. Um, and I yeah, on the well. road, at home he slugs three sixty eight. On the road, he slugs four twenty four. Four twenty four. Well, there um, you go. And on the road, he has a 400 OBP. Yeah, he, he just does better on the road. So that's a big factor. Yeah, that's that a That is a factor. huge factor. <laughs> yeah. Um, Because, yeah, like Kansas City is a is a pretty big pitcher's ballpark. Um, it's one of the biggest. Yeah, so. Probably and, the biggest in the American League, I would argue. And the. Like it's either that or Detroit. And the Yankees ballpark is the quite the opposite. So especially for lefties. Yeah. So I think I think that's more of a story storyline than uh than some people are realizing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that that might be the biggest factor. Yeah, there's a there's a straight up I mean, difference in OPS, there's a straight up uh what is it? Eighty seven, yeah, eighty seven point difference. And and we're OPS. talking about a we're talking about a a 112 TOPS plus on the road. Right, right. Um and batting position. Has he been leading off? No. Yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday was, was his first time. time leading off this year. Yep. So I don't know. I don't they'll probably put LeMahieu back. Maybe they put like Lemayhu lead off, and then just for lefty righty purposes, they put uh, Ben Attendee, then Judge third. Yeah, possibly. I think that's the best. I think that's the best way to do it because Lemayhu does take a lot of walks as well as being a contact guy. Yeah, couple of yeah, a couple of guys good, with like good lead off. Yeah, a couple of guys with like three seventy plus on base percentages, and then Aaron Judge. Mm-hmm. Yes, who also has a three seventy on base percentage. Yeah, much higher, much higher, and he brings a lot. <laughs> And he also has like a 600 slugging percentage. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, so uh, yeah, quality addition from the New York Yankees who are, who have the best record in baseball currently. Um, The Astros are only like two games behind them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was noticing that's way closer than I realized. Like, I think that's, that's an under the radar race of like, Mm. of who's going to have, potential if they both meet in the alcs who's going to have the potential home field advantage i mean it could be very funny if the yankees continue to play like 600 ball from here to the end of the season it's still not unreasonable to think that the astros could still come away with a one seed yeah exactly 
Exactly. Which is like the storyline all year has been the Yankees are playing like out of this world baseball. And they have, I think they've been like 500 over the last like month plus. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, that was before they won one nothing against Kansas City last night. But right. there has been a little bit of a slide, which we all knew was going to happen at some point. They were going to play. They weren't going to play seven hundred ball all year. Yeah, um, I remember they were. Yeah, the like... Astros are two games behind. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of wild. Yeah, like um, the Yankees aren't as far and away the best as they were like yeah a month ago, as you mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. The Astros did have an opportunity, though, because the Yankees lost those two Subway Series games, and at the same time, the Astros lost three in a row. Like, they could have, they could be on top by now. True, true. Yeah. But they're not. They're not. They lost to the A's, at, too. Yikes. Well, Moneyball. So, <laughs> yeah. So they win. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're facing, when you're facing the 2020 ALS champs, I mean, you, you got to be prepared. <laughs> Yeah, they got Liam Hendricks, Marcus Simeon, Matt Chapman, Matt Olson. Yeah. Of, bunch of I mean, studs over guys. there. Bunch of studs <laughs> over there in Oakland. Um, yeah. So that was not the only trade to happen in New York over the past week. Uh, the team in Queens, the New York Metropolitans, uh, made some additions. Um, it started off. Uh, it started off with a trade that happened before, actually before we were recorded last, we just didn't mention it, but uh, Daniel Vogelbach, uh, who was a how about of, of yours, I think in the past month. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Daniel Vogelbach, um, a, you know, power hitting left-handed hitter, um, you know, good, very good for the DH role. Um, you know, he's not exactly going to get it done for you on defense, but the Mets already have Pete Alonso at first, at first base, um, who's going to provide some defense, I guess. Uh, but Daniel Vogelbach, going to stay at first base. Yeah. He's going to catch the baseballs that come at him. Uh, and yeah, Daniel Vogelbach, uh, he's coming over to the Mets. Uh, what, what did you think of this, uh, of this deal? Um, a lot of people were pretty upset with the the pitcher that they gave away. I mean, I believe his name was Holderman. He was not. Um, I looked so funny enough. This trade went down when I was um, like just kind of hanging out with some of my friends. And uh, we happened to be at a Barnes and Noble. And mm-hmm. I, I noticed there was like the, the Baseball America um, like prospects handbook. So I was like. Let me let me check out the guy the Mets just traded. Um, for reference, he actually uh, pitched for the team this year briefly. He's twenty six years old. Um, yeah, he was he, doing pretty well. He was in seventeen and two thirds innings pitched. Uh, he had a two hundred four ERA, nine point two strikeouts per nine, three point six walks per nine, a WHIP of uh, one point one oh zero one nine. Um. Anyway, uh. I checked, I checked him out and he was not in the Mets top 30 at the beginning of the year, but uh, he's done excellent in AAA this year um, for the Mets, a 306 DRA, or sorry, wait, that's, that's uh, RA9, but it's also for the actual team for the Syracuse Mets this year, a uh, two, wow, two five one ERA, uh, 5.67 strikeout per walk. Uh, 1.3 home runs per nine could be better, but you could even chalk that up to triple A. I know those ballparks can be weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in major league baseball, uh, you know, as you mentioned, he had 17 and two thirds in his pitch. He had a two, eight, eight expected ERA. Um, mm-hmm. his line drive rate was 16.7%, which is that's very good. Well below average. His pop-up rate was 11.9%, which is well above average. Um, so the contact against him was pretty good. Um, his strikeout rate was above average and yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, that's a quality reliever to give up, but I imagine maybe it's probably a thing where since he wasn't in the top 30 before the season started, they figured that maybe this success wasn't sustainable for him. Maybe he's just having a really good season and they wanted to take advantage of his success uh while he was having it and maybe thinking uh maybe thinking it wasn't going to work out long term with him yeah i mean the 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 
one like really con here if we're talking pros and cons is he's a 26 year old just being into the majors yeah which is not you know usually not ideal um colin holderman who we're talking about here i two two observations just on his baseball reference bio um one is that he is listed as a as a relief pitcher and center fielder which is Um, very cool that's fun yeah that's a lot of fun yeah uh, and like most Lorenzo. importantly, you know, being being 26 years old, you know, it's not great for a guy coming up in the majors, especially as a bullpen pitcher. You would hope that, you know, you could get a little more of that of those younger years. But he was born on a very special day. Oh, was he born on May 25th? No, he was born on October 8th, 1995. Um. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's game five day. Game five of the Yankees Mariners, uh, yeah, ALDS. Edgar Martinez hitting the game winning double. Doug Strange with the walk. Most importantly, Doug Strange with the walk. Man, well, on like the one hundred forty first pitch that David Cohn threw. It's a shame the Mets uh let him go because he's destined for playoff moment, like clutch playoff moments. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, he's on the Pirates. Yeah, and unfortunately, like. A joke I was about to make was like, well, the, the Mets gave him to the Pirates, so they now they know he's not going to succeed <laughs> um, because the uh, pir- Pirates have had tr- a lot of trouble developing pitchers, um, is the joke there. They have, but they're also good with trading. Yeah, they can be. Like, as you mentioned, I think you mentioned uh, a little while back, like they got Brian, like they got Brian Reynolds, um, in the Andrew McCutcheon trade straight or, or mm-hmm. yeah, in the Andrew McCutcheon deal, you're right. Yeah. Um, with what San, yeah, San Francisco. Um, and yeah, there's been a couple other ones. So stat on the Mets concerning the, uh, their Daniel Vogelbach trade. Um, the Mets from their DHs have, and 80 weighted runs created plus this year. Uh, that is 27th in baseball. So this this deal makes sense because Vogelbach is kind of a prototypical DH. Um, also a DH with uh, a bit of control, I believe. Um, I think. Yes, he has. He's a free agent after the 2024 season. Yeah, so he's got uh, two more years after this uh, with with the Mets if they choose to keep him. Um, so a bit of a longer term solution to, uh, a problem that has actually appeared this year because they just started having a, a DH. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they'll have, they'll have this DH and, uh, and yeah. So when, when you did your, how about that on a uh, Vogelbach, um, what did you particularly highlight again? Um, I mean, I can pull it up right now, but I remember talking about like how his uh, walk rate had gone up, his strikeout rate had gone down uh, during the stretch that I was referring to. Uh, let me let me pull that thing up. Yeah, because admittedly, I've done so many of these that I don't remember specifics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, uh, I can. Was... There it is. Um, he had a two twenty five weighted runs created plus in the span. Yeah, I talked about uh. Strikeout rate being down, a walk rate being up. Uh, batted balls with a certain launch angle were better. Um, sweet spot percentage was better. Uh, the career highs in several batted ball statistics, particularly power-based statistics like expected slugging, barrel rate, WOBA, ex-WOBA, uh, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in Vogelbach's last 23 games, including the games with the Mets, He's hitting 286 with a 975 OPS. Uh, yeah. Also very considerable, 451 on base percentage. Um, and that is a lot because of a walk rate that is 19 divided by 82. 23.2%. Yeah. Um, That's like top of the league type stuff. Yeah, extremely good. Extremely good. Uh, the... Mets the Mets walk rate from their DH uh this season is 8.6 percent so um Vogelbach he's gonna bring I think he's gonna bring a good amount to this uh to this Mets lineup Um, I have to agree with you there 
and and we'll see yeah we'll see about colin holderman what he does um, i think i think he's a guy that the pirates can turn into something i really do see the potential there yeah there's there's potential i think it could work out for both teams for sure um like could be one of those deals uh so and then uh just yesterday the mets acquired tyler naquin um i i don't think they didn't give up anything too significant if i remember correctly i should double check that uh they also got philip deal who what i don't think he's really relevant to the trade i was looking at his numbers (laughs) i think he was just a guy this 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 take could end up being dead wrong but I mean, I don't think Naquin's a huge acquisition. I don't even really see him as a guy that's going to be in the Mets everyday lineup, uh, especially concerning me coming from the fact that he's, you know, going from Cincinnati to, to City Field. Yeah, um, like... And I could be dead wrong about that because I have not looked at his home road splits uh, until right now. And, yeah, I'm absolutely right. He's hitting 263, 340, 505, 845 at home. And 228, 268, 386, 48 on the road. So that is a substantial difference between the two. Yeah. Um, with Tyler Naquin, like, I think I could see how he could be a good addition for another team, but I don't really see how, how this is going to help the Mets. I looked at some numbers and like, yeah, he doesn't do he doesn't do well at all against lefties. He has an OPS. I think he has a 553 OPS against lefties. But you know, 806 OPS. Yeah, exactly. 806 OPS against righties. Um, and I was thinking, oh, maybe maybe this is could be a platoon situation with like Mark Canna, but Mark Canna also has better numbers against righties. Yeah. Um his his uh Canna's OPS against righties is I believe 797. Um, and he does better against lefties than Naquin does against lefties. Um, and, you know, Naquin's gonna, not going to be replacing Braden Nimmo or... Or Starling Marte. Or Starling Marte. Um, so I guess it's a pinch hitter situation. I mean, luckily, I think... Um, like, I believe... I, I don't believe that either of these players were too significant, although... Um, the two players were 18 and 19 years old. So there is a lot of room for, for growth and it would make sense if they weren't mm-hmm. on any list right now, but could be eventually. Um, but like if the Mets are smart, I don't think they'd give up anything. Not to for Tyler Naquin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the Mets are a catcher away and maybe that, maybe that's Francisco Alvarez, but I don't think, I don't know if I want to throw him into that right there. Cause like he's, I mean, He's had his highlights in AAA, but I think overall he has kind of been struggling, and that's fine. Like he's he's still very young. Right. Yeah. I mean, like it's it's hard to rely on what a twenty one or twenty two year old to bolster your team to a playoff run. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like I, I mean, think the Mets are a playoff team with or without Francisco Alvarez, and honestly, with the right catcher, I think they're a World Series contender with or without him. Um, he currently has a seven twenty eight. ERA or uh, seven, yeah, ERA, an OPS of 728 with the big, with the uh, Syracuse Mets, 146 batting average. Um, the OBP and slugging are very much there, though. So I'd say just more consistent uh, hitting, and that's probably the one thing they're really looking for. But uh, I mean, 13 walks in 58 plate appearances is solid, and also, uh, I mean, the slugging percentage of 366 is. Otherwise not good, but with a 146 batting average, it could be worse. Yeah. What would you think about the Mets potentially trading for Wilson Contreras? I mean, I think that's the go big or go home move if you're the Mets. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, with the ground, with the ground coming back, your starting rotation is just about set. Uh, Edwin Diaz alone in the bullpen just signifies your bullpen is fine. And they have some solid setup pieces like Seth Lugo, Drew Smith, if he comes back, Adam Adovino. Like, I think their bullpen, I think, I mean, you know, another reliever wouldn't hurt, but I think they can, they can do fine with the bullpen they currently have. I think the one piece they're really missing is a catcher. And if they really want to go in all in this year, I think Wilson Contreras would be that move because he's the best catcher on the market. 
yeah, Contreras would be a major upgrade, um, but definitely he's 100% only going to be there this year. Uh, there's, they're not, mm-hmm. the Mets would be stupid to try and sign him long term because obviously the, the number one prospect in baseball is their guy and he's a catcher. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah. And he's like, also remarkably young too. Yes, yes. We, so, uh, we saw him earlier this year. Yeah, we did at uh, what a fun time. Hartford. Um, yeah, but yeah, a great uh, day. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the yeah, I think I think um, yeah, probably not probably not the end for the Mets in the trading department. Um, Francisco Alvarez is about to turn twenty one years old. Nice. <laughs> that's that's absurd. He was born in November of two thousand one. Nice. Um. So yeah, that's that's sick. That's pretty lovely. Um. So yeah. Uh. Do we want to get into players to highlight? Yeah, let's do it. Um. All right. So now we get into the part we've most prepared for with our players to highlight, starting with our Friday, July 29, 2022 edition of... How about that? Who do you have for us today? So you did uh, Sean Murphy last time, and you prefaced it by saying that I'm doing an A, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I was going to do this guy next time, but I guess you got him out of the way for me. But uh, I was talking about Cole Irvin, yeah. who since July 4th has a... 185 ERA, 247 FIP, and an American League leading 1.1 F war, not B war, F war, quote, yeah. quote an F war pitcher. How about it? Uh, his 2.4% walk rate is the best among the two, among the 74 qualifiers in the span, and his 0.26 home runs per nine is the fourth highest or the fourth lowest. Uh, and the three people above him have not given up a home run. He's given up one to Jordan Alvarez, which I mean, that shouldn't even count against him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> Uh, in the span, he is throwing. He went from throwing his four seamer thirty two point nine percent of the time in June to throwing it forty nine point five percent of the time in July. Uh, he's been decreasing both his changeup and sinker usage to throw his four, four seamer more, which is very funny because uh, Cole Irvin is not a velocity guy, and he's ditching his off speeds to throw yeah. it and breaking stuff to throw a fastball more. And <laughs> In July, opponents are batting 107 off of his four seamer with a 196 slugging percentage. Uh, that average leads the 114 pitchers with at least 25 plate appearances ending on fastballs in August er, in July, and his slugging percentage ranks eighth. And also, Chris, I know you like this stat. Uh, in the month of July, Irvin leads all AL pitchers in run value on fastballs below 91 miles an hour at negative 4.3. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I knew that was a Chris Giotta stat, so I had to throw it in there. Yeah, I I, I enjoy that for sure. Uh, Cole Irvin. It's funny because you see so many guys like, why why do guys even throw four seamers anymore? Like, what's the point? Like a fastball that just goes straight? Yeah. When you could throw a fastball with movement. Uh, Cole Irvin, it's like the last guy you'd expect to be doing so, and it's working for him. Right, yeah. You know, for some the things can be uh things can can be different for some people. Um all right, uh my how about that. I'll I'll first tell you how I found this how about that. I kind of was just like I was going through uh baseball reference team pages and was like looking, you know, you know, what teams haven't we done? Um I'm pretty sure we still haven't done this team, but like I, and then that's when I found, that's when I found kind of my golden goose, my guy. Oh boy. This is, it, it not only has it been doing very well, but he fits, he fits my mold of guys I like and that Cole Irvin mold. I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at Hobie Milner out of the Brewers bullpen. Yes. Yes. Hobie Milner out of the Brewers bullpen. He's, uh, for those unaware, like, you know, I kind of, I basically found out about him yesterday, to be honest with you. Um, he started his career in 2017. He's like 30 right now. So he's not necessarily a young gun, but he's really figured it out this year. Um, he's not high velocity at all. I'm looking at his savant page right now. His sinker average is 88.7 miles per hour 
and his four seamer averages 89.1 miles per hour. Um, so he's generally a below 90 mile per hour guy. Um, but he gets soft contact uh, amazingly. And in his last 17, uh, 17 appearances, not plate appearances, in his last 17 appearances, he has a 0.54 ERA, a 2.40 FIP, and a 447 OPS against in 16 and two thirds innings pitch. Out of 183 qualifiers in the span, his ERA ranks sixth. Um, also, surprisingly enough, his strikeout rate has gone from 17% before the span to 27% in the span, a 10% increase in strikeouts, which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, amazing to see. Uh, his average exit velocity has gone from 84.4 miles per hour in the span to 79.8 miles per hour in the span. The average exit velocity on for in the league generally is like 89 miles per hour, and he's down near 79 miles per hour. Uh, out of 452 pitchers with 25 plus batted balls against them in the span, Milner has the lowest average exit velocity against out of 452 along with that 46.3 percent of the batted balls against him have been hit 80 miles per hour or less which is the highest percentage out of 452 that's a 46.3 percent rate of batted balls of 80 80 miles per hour or less the league average is 25.7 percent um so the league does it at like uh a quarter he's doing it at almost um almost half and uh along with that concerning the strikeouts from hobie milner the strikeout increase he has gone from getting the strikeout 33 percent of the time when he reaches two strikes to 49 percent of the time uh when he reaches two strikes so he went from about a, a third of the time when he gets to a two strike count getting that strikeout to about half the time now um, he's getting the strikeout when he gets to two strikes. So Hobie Milner. Crossing so, good stuff. Us. Good stuff. Couple things. Um, I, I had taken a quick glance at him and I was like, I just went reliever diving. I'll keep him in the back of my mind for later if he continues. Um, so you took that one off my back. Um, uh, when you say you discovered him yesterday does that mean you discovered that he exists yesterday or you discovered that he's, he was good yesterday um kind of that he existed i didn't really i, I don't mm. know see that's a lie because you have a homie hobie milner memory and you don't even realize it i do so uh opening day 2020 uh you were at my house and we were watching uh a's angels and it was Ugh. the first game in the history of Major League Baseball to go to extra innings and have the the ghost runners on second, and the Angels did not get their run across in the in the in the tenth, and uh, the, they brought in some reliever who ended up loading the bases with zero outs, and they brought in Hobie Milner, who on the very first pitch gave up a walk off grand slam to Matt Olson. Oh my God! <laughs> and, and you and I were like dying laughing at just the very first pitch that the dude threw. And Holson just hit a tank. Yeah. Okay. You do you remember this, right? Yes, I remember. I remember that moment. I did not remember it was a uh, Hobie Milner. <laughs> but uh, the time the times are changing. I kind of want to pull up that that home run. Hobie Milner is one Hang of on. the. I'm gonna go to Savant and find that home run. Yeah, times are changing. Hobie Milner is, um, one of the most effective relievers out of the brewers bullpen uh 189 era on the year overall 0.54 era in his last 17 appearances um yeah very funny that he's been more effective than josh Hader overall this season yeah yeah i will you know it is i will say though that you know i think we talked about it last <laughs> episode but Hader, Hader like before his previous two appearances had like a one eight two ERA and then he gave up nine runs in a third of an inning. Mm -hmm. Um yep. Yeah, not good. Yeah, that was very fun. Now he was having a Josh Hader type year, but then it was funny because he was selected to the all-star team uh before these outings, but the all-star game was after these outings. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It was like it was like hey here's our all-star with a 450 ERA. 
Yeah, out of the bullpen. Because that's just that's just how relievers work. I don't think he ended up getting used in that game, understandably. Right, right. All right, we're gonna we're gonna watch this together. So this is uh July or July twenty fourth, very almost the almost two years of the day, twenty twenty. Hey, there's one out. Okay. I was wrong about there being no outs. There was one. Hopefully just not. All right. So uh base is loaded. One out. And uh here we go. Somebody. First pitch what is hit. Right field. This is going to win it. Let's just see how far it goes. And wow. it is gone. That's a grand slam home run to walk this thing off. Matt Olson does not wait around. He hits one into the seats. And it's a 7-3 to three final in extra innings. Oh, my goodness. What is, what is going on in two? So the first person to ever have an unearned run on uh, – on actual, well, I guess technically he wasn't the first person to have an unearned run. It was the pitcher before, but the first person to give up the game-winning run, so to speak. And also, I, innings with the I remember runner. us rooting for the walk-off because we didn't know what a walk-off was going to look like in 2020. When yep. like it was encouraged to social distance, and yeah. there was no fans in the stands. This the way it happened was also just so funny. Like it was very first pitch off the new pitcher, lefty lefty matchup. Matt Olson just hits one to the top of that that row there. Yeah, uh, that section in right field, and you and I just sat there laughing for like five minutes. <laughs> and two years later, he's a how about that? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a how about that in itself. That's a full circle moment for sure. Yeah, if I've ever um, seen one. <laughs> so. Now we're going from the very high highs to the uh, to the lows, where we're talking players or subjects that have been underperforming for our um, Friday, July 29, 2022 edition of Slightly Alarming. Who do you have for us today? Um, so I talked about how the Mets are a catcher way. They're actually a catcher way and a Jeff McNeil getting out of his slump away. Yeah. Uh, Jeff McNeil since June 29th is slashing 152, 233, 182 for a 415 OPS uh, and a 29 weighted runs created plus. His slugging percentage ranks dead last among the 174 qualifiers and his weighted runs created plus ranks second to last. Uh, before June 29th, he had an average exit velocity of 87.2 miles an hour, which isn't like outstanding, but it's Jeff McNeil. Like he's never been that type of guy. And in this span, it is down to 83.5 miles per hour, which is very bad. Yeah. In the span, 37% of his batted balls have an exit velocity but below 92 miles an hour or at 92 miles an hour and a launch angle above 20 degrees, which if you're hitting at 20 degrees with a hard hit with a exit velocity that's less than the hard hit threshold, it's not a surprise that he's over 20 on such batted balls. Ah. Uh. He's 20 such batted balls, 37% of the time, and he's 0 for 20. Uh, that 37% ranks seventh worst among the 193 hitters with at least 50 batted balls over that span. And additionally, before the span, 14.5% of his batted balls were between 22 and 33 degrees, and in this span, it is up to 20.4 degrees. Uh, he is 0 for 11 on such, on such occurrences. Uh, he's not hitting the ball well, and... For a guy like Jeff McNeil, who makes a career off contact hitting, he's hitting the ball in the air way too much. Yeah, Jeff McNeil. Slightly alarming. Um, yeah, I also have Jeff McNeil. Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, what I will note is from June 21 to June 27, he missed five games with a hamstring injury, and then he started having this very bad 20-game span. Uh, I, I chose – June twenty eighth is my is my uh, arbitrary date, so a day off. You're one day off. Yeah, uh, hitting... I don't think we've ever had a same player and same time threshold. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Um, so in yeah, in those twenty games, hitting one fifty nine with the four twenty five OPS, slugging an OPS rank last of a out of a hundred seventy three qualifiers, uh, out of two hundred one batters with. 50 plus batted balls in this span. His expected Woba ranks 180th. Um, yeah, average exit velocity goes from 87.3 miles per hour to 83.3 miles per hour. Hard hit rate goes from 35% to 20%. And out of 201 batters, his average exit velocity 
uh, is fifth lowest in the span and his hard hit rate is second lowest in the span. Um, so yeah, Jeff McNeil from both of us getting a slightly alarming. Um, that, that was kind of like, that was kind of the, I, the guy that popped out for sure. <laughs> um, when looking at these, uh, looking at these spans and who's been doing poorly. Yes. Um, yeah. So that does it for players to highlight for good and bad reasons. And now we shall get into a preview of the week end ahead. Um, I will be looking at series to watch January. We'll be looking at some of the day by day matchups. Um, I have, you know, there's there's some series to watch for different reasons for sure. Um, Red Sox Brewers at Fenway Park. Red Sox are, you know, continuously fighting to keep their playoff ho- hopes alive, pretty much. Funnily enough, they're last place in the AL East, but I mean, you know, they're 500. It's different than being last place in the, in like the NL Central. Um, and then the uh, Brewers are three games up on the Cardinals, looking to keep that distance from the Cardinals uh, and some interleague matchups. You know, don't you don't see the Brewers at Fenway too, too often uh, until until the next Last time was 2014. Yeah, I remember it was April of 2014. I remember yeah. uh, that was the day I devoted my hatred to Edward, Edward Mojica. Yeah, home opener. It was the first home opener the Red Sox lost in like literally like nine years. Because I grew up, I grew up to know the Red Sox like it was an automatic they'd win the home opener. Like you just don't lose yeah. the home opener. You're not allowed to. No. I thought you just weren't allowed to. Now they like never Red win Sox. them. I feel like. Yeah, they didn't win it this year. Um. They didn't win it in 2021. They didn't. They did win it in 2020. They lost it in 2019. Yep. Uh, they did win it in 2018. Uh, I don't have much memory beyond that. Yeah. They lost it in 2016. 2017. Um, I'm blanking on. Oh no, they, they won. They won, they won in, 2017. in 2017. They were playing the Pirates. So. Yeah, I mean, come on. Makes sense. Rick Porcello, opening day starter. Um, <laughs> against Garrett Cole. Against Garrett Cole. <laughs> um. So yeah, Red Sox Brewers. Um, then you have also uh, <laughs> Rays Guardians is interesting. A couple of uh, aspiring playoff teams. It's yeah, going to be a Tropicana goals. Field. Um, Astros Mariners. Um, they played recently at T-Mobile Park. Astros swept Mariners. Um, so we'll see if the Mariners can recover from that at Minute Maid Park. And uh, the last series to watch would be Padres Twins, a uh, rare, um, rare interleague matchup. That's at uh, Petco Park. Padres looking to hold on um, to their playoff position. They're they're kind of secure where they're at, I will say. Um, and then the Twins are looking to hold on to uh, their American League Central uh, first place standing. Uh, what do you got for the day by day matchups? Uh, did you move? Did you pass the ball to me? Uh, yeah, I was. I thought there okay. was a delay. <laughs> you lagged. No, you lagged. Um, so on Friday tonight, July 29th, we have. Miles Michaelis versus Anibal Sanchez, who I admittedly did not realize was still in the league. We got a – was that game one of the uh, 2019 NLDS? Um, who uh, – Miles Michaelis versus Anibal Sanchez? Um, 2019 NLDS. Uh, it was – NLCS? NLCS, that's what I meant. NL – or – Oh, yeah, the Sanchez pitched game one. It absolutely is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a game one. <laughs> oh my god. I a, anyway, that's matchup of the night. We got a game one rematch. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Um how's Bailey faltering to the Phillies? I've seen that name a couple of times. Have not really checked in. Is it is he is he worth a mention in this? I mean he already got mentioned. He's pitching tonight for the Phillies against the Pirates. Spoiler alert. 
this page isn't quite loading right now. Uh, he, eh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he's facing Jose Quintana. That's going to be interesting. Garrett Cole will be facing the Royals for the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. Alec Manoa will be facing the Tigers for the Blue Jays at Rogers Center. Uh, Shane Bieber and Jeffrey Springs will be facing each other in Guardians Rays in Tampa. Brandon Woodruff versus Brian Bayo in the opener of Red Sox Brewers at Fenway. Madison Baumgartner versus Kyle Wright in Diamondbacks Braves. This is I love when the, the Braves and Diamondbacks play each other, and it's the one time the Braves are not the first team, like, alphabetically in the matchup. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like called <laughs> get, get Babbitt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to decide on match for the night, but I guess I will not decide on Robbie Ray versus Justin Verlander. I'll go with a different one, but that is a very, that was a close second place in Mariners yeah. Astros in Houston. Uh, James Caprillion versus Lance Lynn in the match with guys that need to get it together. Uh, Julio Arias versus Chad Cool in Dodgers Rockies at Coors. Martin Perez versus Patrick Sandoval in Rangers Angels in Anaheim. Did you see that graphic, by the way, that uh, that the Angels put up on their scoreboard when Jonah Heim came to the plate and said, "I'm like, if he ever has a daughter, he should consider naming her Anna." Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> that was very funny. Uh, ooh, Joe Ryan versus Blake Snell in Twins Padres. That is a good matchup. Could yeah. be the Chris Paddock return, but unfortunately. Uh, it was not meant to yeah. be. We're going to see a Taylor, versus... a Taylor Rogers revenge game. Yes. Uh, Marcus Stroman versus Alex Cobb in uh, Cubs versus Giants. And well, a match of the night comes from Mets Marlins in Miami. It's Chris Bassett versus Sandy Alcantara. Yeah. Anytime Sandy Alcantara faces like a top three starter in any rotation it's pretty much guaranteed to be matchup of the night because yeah yeah the, guy, the guys must watch i believe his one like not great outing over the last like two months has come against the mets nice nice anyway uh on saturday you will have Corey kluber facing the guardians his old team in which he won two cy youngs with yeah uh, for the rays hmm. You will have Zach Greinke versus Nestor Cortez in Royals-Yankees. That's a fun matchup just for the – they're like two two weird guys, but in very different ways. One of them is weird on the field. One of them is weird off the field. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, can I say something? Uh, oh, the, yeah. The, what's funny about Corey Kluber, like, facing the Guardians is like, oh, he's going to be with all his old, old teammates, but it's like – there's barely any old teammates because yeah. they're the guardians. No, actually, they don't not. keep anybody. <laughs> no, none of them. I guess Jose Ramirez, Shane Bieber, I guess it's and Jose that's Ramirez. It. Shane Bieber, Jose yeah. Ramirez, and that's about it. <laughs> but yeah, and that's it. Yeah, uh, we have another homecoming. Drew Hutchinson will be facing the Blue Jays in Toronto. Big time, big, big time. time. I mean, I'm sure Blue Jays fans remember. Yes, Drew Hutchinson's service to the to Canada. Yes. Um, Eric Lauer versus Nick Pavetta in Brewers Red Sox. Carlos Carrasco will be facing the Marlins for the Mets on Saturday. Tyler Malley will be facing the Orioles for the Reds. Once again, very surprised his name has just not come up in trade talks. Uh, who? Tyler Malley. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Like, okay, are the Mets – like, there's plenty of Luis Castillo trade rumors. Nothing on Tyler Malley. Which is Weird. just odd because he is he's younger too. What's he's that? Young, he's younger than Castillo. He's younger, he has control. He's he has only two years of control. Like he's a free agent after 2023. Yeah. I'm trying to pull up his home road splits if you want to do that for me, because baseball reference is being weird. Um yeah. I'll Chris Flexen will be facing the Astros for the Mariners. Um that's, I'll say that for matchup of the night. That's a decent matchup. Paul Blackburn versus Johnny Cueto in A's White Sox. Um, Ian Anderson will be facing the Diamondbacks for the Braves. Clayton Kershaw and Kyle Freeland will be facing each other in Dodgers Rockies. I'm sure they've faced each other several times. Wow. This is very funny, but Kyle Freeland has much more played appearances versus the current Dodgers roster versus, I guess it makes sense, Clayton Kershaw versus the current Rockies roster because much of the Dodgers roster is probably the same from many years past. Yeah, yeah. Um. I guess that does make a little sense. Um, and then matchup of the day. 
No, it is matchup of the night. Matchup of the night comes from Twins Padres. Sonny Gray versus Joe Musgrove. Uh yeah, yeah. I, I like that one. Uh, Tyler Molle, by the way, um, four nine four ERA at home, three eight three on the road. Uh, big difference in slugging. Uh, four fifty three slugging yeah, at sense. home, and three eighteen slugging against on the road. Yeah, as well as right, as let's... well as nine nine home runs allowed at home, three on the road. All right, I'm going to try to rapid fire through Sunday. Uh, Jose Barrios will be facing the Tigers for the Blue Jays in Toronto. Andre Pallante will be facing the Nationals for the Cardinals in D.C. Uh, Aaron Nola versus J.T. Brubaker in the finale of Phillies Pirates. Um, Jordan Montgomery will be facing the Royals for the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. You will have Shane McClanahan facing the Guardians for the Rays in Tampa. Taiwan Walker will be facing the Marlins for the Mets. George Kirby will be facing the Astros for the Mariners. Dylan Cease will be facing the uh, A's for the White Sox in Chicago. Tony Gonsolin versus Herman Marquez in Dodgers Rockies. That's a good one at Coors. Dane Dunning versus Reed Detmers. A couple of young starters that are trying to establish themselves this year. Sean Manaya will be facing the Twins for the Padres. Adrian Sampson versus Carlos Rodon in Cubs Giants in San Francisco. And matchup of the day comes from Diamondbacks Braves. It's going to be Merrill Kelly versus Max Freed. Yeah, quality matchup. Quality matchup for sure. Uh, Merrill Kelly, yeah, surprise, surprise year this year. Low three ZRA. Freed is uh, performing like one of the better, better starters in baseball. Uh, and yeah. that will do. He's, it he's for- one of those. Uh, I mentioned. Um, I mentioned. Uh, Cole Irvin has only given up one home run. There are three guys that haven't. Max Free is one of them. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't given up a home run in July, which is crazy. Yeah, uh, big time. Yeah, Max Free has mm-hmm. been – he's having his best year this year so far, and he was already doing very well in 2020 and 2021. Um, yeah. All right, well, that should do it for this installment of Above Replacement Radio. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this one. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, uh, go to our YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, if you want to follow us on social media, follow me on Twitter at Chris underscore Gianta and follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Curran. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope to see you on Tuesday, episode 200. It's the single season's draft. We're having Rob Dickey, Bono Siddhartha, Nico Fasella back on for the single season's draft. It's going to be a big one. Big draft, episode 200. We can't wait to see you. Pause. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over.